All right. Good morning, John. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Peter. From Bedford to Miami. Yes. How was that experience for you? Be honest. I, uh, I am. No, I, I don't want to be too, I don't want to come off as too um, flattering. Um, so I've, I've, I went to Oxford. So I'm very familiar with England. I love it. A bit of an Anglophile, very close to the UK consulate in New York. And so uh, I, but I had not experienced that side of it. I was actually born in Reading, yeah. the, oh. next, the next town from Oxford. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. Gr great experience. Everyone loved Americans back then. Friends was popular. It was fantastic. Amazing. I'd never seen, um, I mean, Oxford's kind of rural, I guess, but, but you have the whole educational component to it. So I'd never seen that side of England. Um, what you, I'm going to be, you know, maybe this will come off as obsequious, but what you've done there um, is, is extraordinary. And so I'd heard stories about like the way that these, these teams are sort of communal activities and, and family activity. But, uh, you know, as a father, like, like seeing how those families came together and seeing what you've created in that community, um, it was awesome and a huge fan. Well, I can't take all the credit. There's a lot of people who have been involved in it. Um, Connor there has been hugely involved. Danny's been involved and he's there. Emma, who will be arriving, landing very soon. Mm -hmm. She's a massive part of it. Uh, had you been to a football match before? No. So your first ever football match was a 10th tier yeah. non-league football match in Bedford. I mean, just watching the World Cup at a cafe in New York count? No, that doesn't count. Okay, then no. You got lucky yeah. as well. What was it, like 7-0 or 7 Yeah, one? you crushed them. Yeah. yeah. It was, um, who were we playing? Was it Tame? Yeah, Tame. Oh, and we also got the trophy. You got the trophy. I, did, what I, I bought a scarf. Yeah. I was walking through the town, um, and I was told by somebody not to wear that scarf in certain parts of the town. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I almost felt like if, if, if you had hired a group of actors to create the idyllic football rural England experience for a visiting American, uh, it could not have gone better. Well, Bedford's very different from Oxford. So Oxford is a, a you'd say, a posh town. Posh. Yeah, it's, yes. uh, it's a wealthy town. Bedford's more of a deprived town. It's got, you know, like any town, it's got its good areas and bad areas, but it's quite deprived. Um, so it's a, definitely a different experience for people. But what I've, what's always amazed me is actually I don't think I've ever appreciated it enough because people come in, they come down the river, they, they stay at the embankment of this one. They're like, this is a nice place. From the outside in, it's gorgeous. Yeah. But like I came from uh, Staten Island, right, which is uh, the Bedford of New York, uh, it sounds like. Uh, and um, from the outside in, Staten Island's not beautiful. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's nice. There's some parts that are nice. But uh, um, for me, coming to Bedford, it looked like this idyllic gorgeous town i mean are those real swans or they real. bring those in or no, they, yeah? they're real swans yeah yeah you could not have those in new york city somebody would go after the swans God, God, isn't yeah. it a crime against the king to kill a swan yeah i think so yeah you, I the think property you, of the king yeah the property of the king i think if you kill a swan yeah. you go to jail treason is that treason. The, I, I always thought those were things they told visiting yanks to yeah. just get us that could also be true <laughs> scared <laughs> Look at, no i think it's true yeah i think it's true what 10 years apparently 10 years 10 years yeah for per swan months. yeah Wow. Yeah, so they're, they're real swans. We have real rowers there. We yes, have, uh, well, I rode. I rode for Oxford. That was my... Oh, did that was you? My, so I kind of ingratiated myself into UK society. How Did you race the boat race? Um, I was not. I was, I was on Exeter College team. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah not, not in the boat race. I went to the boat race, but I did, I did the summer sprints at Oxford, which were like the university-level boat race. So and, I went uh, to the yeah. boat race this year. Yeah. Uh, Cameron and Tyler, uh, Wink of Oz, put, got me on the uh, yeah. boat that follows the, the rowers. The, yes. Whatever they call that. Uh, yeah. That was a wild experience. I I, I, yeah. I didn't appreciate how hard the rowing is from the TV, but when you're following it and you're seeing the water move, how choppy it was, it's like, this is hard. Oh, it's insanely hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever done athletically. Um, and uh, I think rowers, I'm, I'm biased, but I think rowers are the, the, the optimal athletes. Um, just cardio, fitness, strength. Uh, it's tough. If you're not built like Cameron and Tyler, it's tough to row for Oxford. Because I think, I, I forget the physics, but every inch of reach which is height plus arm length, you give up like 40 pounds of pressure. I'm probably directionally, I'm directionally correct, but not exactly, but you give up. So if someone's like six inches taller than me and has like six inches more reach or eight inches more reach, it's a couple of hundred pounds of, of force that they're able to exert that I'm not. So I had to be, so I don't look at now, I'm about 175, 80 pounds now. I was 210 with almost no body. I was enormous. I used to get up and eat a chicken and lift weights because my only way to catch up, because I'm six foot if I stretch, all the guys I rode with on the senior varsity boat were 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and to make up those four inches, I had to be, you know, 100 pounds stronger than them on my pull. I can match you on yeah. the weight, just not the height. <laughs> <laughs> I'm six foot if I lie. 
Yeah. The lifts, everyone wears lifts now. Reality doesn't matter anymore. So Dude, just some, some girl, so our accountant, <laughs> my accountant, Laura, right? She's very tall. She's basically six foot and she's always mm -hmm. ribbing me about my height. We went out one night. She came along. She gave me some lifts to bring to my shoes. I was like, fuck off. She's like, no, come on. You're going to wear them. You're a midget. And I was like, no, I'm not wearing them. Did you wear them? I put them in. I got to say, it felt good to be tall. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of the last thing you can make fun of, right? Short, short men. Yeah, you can get away with that. That's it. Yeah, yeah. We, we, haven't, we haven't made that. No like, one's uh, been canceled not for making fun of a short guy. No, I'm, I, I, I can take, I mean, <laughs> my children give it to me all the time. My daughter's 13. She's caught me up. Does she hold things over you? I used to hold things over my mom's head. My mom's, my mom, she's Italian. We call them stove height. They're right at the, they're, she's just four, she says she's five foot, but she's, I used to grab things and hold them over her head. Just, it's cringeworthy how bad I treated my mother. Well, I get it all yeah. the time from my son, constantly. <laughs> I think he, he asked me, he wanted a step yesterday. Oh. Uh, but I could still kick his ass. So I'm yeah. That. Yeah. Until that day, you can't. It's close. Occasionally yeah. he wins and then I lie. I'm like, oh, my back, my back. <laughs> But anyway, mate, good to see you. Good to see you. We got the trophies. We're gonna get you back. Um, so when we when we were planning this interview, that sat down to talk about it, Danny was like, started telling me stories, and I was like, what? <laughs> what, what? What? That as well? I was like, who the f who who is this guy? Like, it's uh, there's <laughs> there's some shit to talk about today. Uh, I know we're gonna get into Bitcoin at some point, but the, yeah. there's so much more mad stuff to talk about. So. Most of us have never been kidnapped, let alone oh, we're twice. Jump, we're jumping right in. Let, yeah. let, let alone twice. Which one? Which one are we starting with? Which kidnapping? Which one came first? Yeah, um, the the fake one. Um, so okay, so so just just to set the set the stage for for why uh, why I'm interesting enough to be on your podcast, I guess if I if I am at all. Cause, um, you know, I think I think I've asked this question a lot, and so what I've, the answer I've now come up with is, I realized looking back, I just I made a decision after business school to optimize for stories. So I don't know where I got it from. I think it was my dad, but I've always um, whoever dies with the most stories wins. That was my that's been my motto. So I think when you, I think uh, I, when I got asked to give young men advice, my advice to them is just you have to optimize for something. I don't know what age, maybe mid twenties. Um, you can optimize for wealth. I know a lot, of, I went to Harvard Business School, a lot of my friends optimize for wealth. It's nothing wrong with that. I do think give a moral obligation to do something with it, but fine, optimize for wealth. It's never um, fulfilling. Uh, probably not, but I, I know, you know John Arnold, there's some of the name drop him. He's a guy in my industry, hedge fund industry, who became a multi-billionaire and is doing unbelievable things for the world. I think you're right. I think it's hard to, it's hard to be happy, but it's possible. I think, yeah. I think if you make money and you want to do yeah. something with it for other people, yes. fine. But yes. if you want to make money for you. Oh yeah, I agree. It's just, it never yeah, works. I agree. I, don't, I try not to judge. Uh, you do you. But yes, I, I per personally, like like off off the record, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's a happy life. And no one, no, no one I know, no billionaire I know who, who has not turned to others. Look, you, you can do both. That's the thing that's about being a billionaire. You, you, you can have the planes and jets and everything and still change the world and still do that. Like that. The people like, it's like, I'm not expecting people to be uh, altruistic and uh, give away everything and live in a shack after making a billion dollars. But um, it's always striking to me that you can, absolutely do both and have all that elements of life. It's shocking more people don't do it. Um, but there's that. You can optimize for wealth. Uh, you can optimize for power. So a lot of people go into politics and or to try to get up in an organization and, and and don't care as much about equity value and wealth and whatnot because they want power. And again, that's that's fine. Again, as long as you are happy and maybe do something good with it. Um, I optimize for stories. Um, so uh, practically what that means is I just put myself in situations where I could likely do interesting things. And when the opportunity to do those interesting things happened, I grabbed it. So when I was, um, uh, you know, graduated Harvard Business School and, you know, was all signed up to go work for a big investment bank. And uh, I'd won this weird fellowship. I'd, so I had this, this interesting organization called the National Italian American Foundation. I'd won their fellowship. I couldn't afford to go to business school. So uh, they paid for like 90% of it. Um, I won their I won their fellowship that year, and so I was uh, graduated. I was going to thank them at their annual event, and the chairman of the New York Mercantile Exchange, which is not a place most Harvard Business School graduates went, was being honored as Man of the Year, very famous wealthy Italian guy. And uh, after my speech, he approached me and um, said, "Well, are you happy? Where, where are you going? Because I'm going to go work for X Y Z Bulge Bracket Investment Bank. You know, uh, two immigrant parents, every every dream. That's like I had made it." Um, and he said, are you happy? And I was like, oh, I'm not 
really got excited. And he said, well, I work for the New York Mercantile Exchange. We're a bunch of degenerate oil traders in the southern pit of Manhattan that set the benchmark for the world's most valuable commodity. You should come work for me. And um, that was a chance to optimize for wealth or stories. And I chose stories. And that was sort of the beginning of the end. And then uh, one day he was, I was in the office late and he called me up and said, he stuck his head out of his office and said, um, I just got a phone call from Sheikh Mohammed in Dubai. They want to open up, and again, this is 2002. They want to open up an exchange in Dubai. We're never opening up an exchange in Dubai. That's how we talk. But Johnny, we're never doing this. But I, I got, we got to be nice. He's a, he's a, he's a shake, you know, go, go, go over there, go over there. Just because I was the only one in the office still. Go to Dubai and just be nice and tell them no. And I went to Dubai and I was supposed to stay for two days. I stayed for 10 and I came back and I said, Vinny, um, something incredible happening there. Um, we, we need to really consider this. And he was like, there is no way our board of directors, we've never done anything internationally. Our first thing is not going to be Dubai. You know, and now everyone talks about Dubai. Back then, nobody talked about Dubai. And um, six years later, we opened up an exchange in Dubai, the first, first ever derivatives exchange to price crude oil in the Middle East. So stories. So um, the fake kidnapping story, um, we talk about billionaires getting bored. So I'm not going to name drop him because you don't want to piss off billionaires. But there's a billionaire I know who's, uh, who does good things. He's, he's a good guy. Uh, but he's also bored. And one way boredom manifests in men, I found with wealth, is they start doing outrageous things with their wealth. Um, and I had not known him. I didn't know him. Uh, but I knew um, a very good friend of his who was his attorney. And the attorney and I were working on a deal together. And he said, oh, you should come meet this guy. And I'm going to change the country too because I want to identify him. Let's say Cambodia. He goes, he's, he's throwing a party in Cambodia and we should go. And I want to, I've told him about you. And so I'll, I'll keep it brief. We go to Cambodia, we surprise him. He had a huge party for his family throw, throwing, throwing a party. And um, we show up and, and he picks us up in this beautiful minivan with like 20 of his friends from, from wherever, college, wherever, old friends. And we go and he's, he does a lot of charitable investing as we go to this like very bad part of Cambodia to show us this like charitable schools he's built. And the van pulls over in a very bad part of Cambodia and the door opens up and the driver just runs. So we're all sitting there like, what is going on? And all of a sudden, um, and I was by the front, so I closed the door because I'm from New York and like my spidey sense sort of tingling, something's going on. I closed the door. It was a hut, like a shack. Door opens up and these 10 jacked dudes just come running out and they're pushing the van and they're punching it and they're screaming, we're gonna kill you, we're gonna kill you. They tear the door open, rush in, go straight for me. 20 guys there, straight for me, ignore everybody else, drag me out. Uh, one of them grabs this wooden chair on the street, he smashes it, he holds the wood up to my neck. He's like, we're gonna kill you. Drags me to the back of this Quonset hut. Um, they got me on my knees. Two guys are holding me from the back uh, very tight, which I found out later was to protect me. And they're doing these crazy kicks, like spin kicks, like missing my face by an inch, screaming. The whole thing lasted like probably 90 seconds to 120 seconds, felt, maybe three or four minutes. Felt longer? Felt like a lifetime. And now, Peter, we, as men, we all like to think how we'll act in that situation when we think we're, we're about to die and we'll act stoically. Absolutely not. I was I was a mess. I was offering anything they wanted. Yeah. I was, it just just melted down completely. It was shit into this is pre kids. Now I'd probably go into a puddle, um, and then all of a sudden I hear laughing, and I see the billionaire guy and his friends peeking out from behind the hut, hysterical laughter, and the guys let me go. And it turns out they're professional kung fu actors, like in the backgrounds of Bollywood films. And he, he does donate money to the school and they train them in kung fu as a way to get out. Like it's like, it's like basketball in the inner city in the US. Like it's a way to get out of the ghetto there is like to, is to develop the skill. And I go up to the guy and I'm like, what? I'm sorry, I don't want to curse on your podcast. You can't say what can, the fuck you like, yeah. like, What the fuck? And he looks at me and he goes, I'm so sorry. He goes, it wasn't supposed to be you. They were supposed to grab my buddy of 20 years, but you look like him. And I'm like, but why didn't you stop it? And he's like, this took me like six months to set up. It was going really well. <laughs> and that was it. And he just, no remorse, no, just, just I, I can do it. I wanted to do it. So I did it. So I did it. And, and how, how few people can do that, can set the method. The people that had to be involved, the driver, that, I mean, it takes not just money, it takes just resources to set that up right. You can do it like, you can ask your buddy to punch me on the street 
right? You can, you can do the middle class billionaire <laughs> version of that. The way he did it, I was safe. They were protected. They had a medic just in case something went wrong. He, had, he hired a medic to be there. That's a billionaire practical joke. Uh, how long until you were able to look back and laugh at that? Um, I got him back a couple of years later. It took me, it took me about, I'd say, uh, almost six months, I think. It, re it, it definitely, it definitely um, messed with my head um, a little bit. It was the first time I, I've, led, I've led a, you know, I was born in, born in St Brooklyn and Staten Island. Like I, I had a, I would say, a, I wouldn't say a rough life, but I, had a, I, I definitely didn't grow up privileged. Um, but I was never like, I, I never had a like, fear for my life. Um, I was privileged to that, to that degree. So yeah, I probably was privileged, but, uh, but it was the first time I, it was the first time that I felt truly in danger, like, and, and that's shakes you to the core. And I realized how I act in those situations, which yeah. is not. It's one of those scenarios <laughs> where you think a manly, I, I may, I may die here. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. nice one billionaire yeah. friend. Uh, okay. Yeah. Tell me about the real kidnap. So, so the first time I went to, uh, it was not in the UAE, by the way, the UAE is incredibly safe. Um, I'm a huge fan of the UAE and we should get, we should talk about that because I know now it's the yeah. hottest thing in the world. And, and there are, I have some guidance for your listeners who are thinking they're just going to get on a plane and get off and get handed bags of money from, <laughs> from the UAE. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, this was a lot less dramatic to, amazingly. Um, when the first time, first time I went to Dubai, uh, with NYMEX, NYMEX is a, you know, it was interesting. It's now it's owned by the CMA. It was a critically important company. Like people don't, it was very sleepy. But when I joined, it was private. It wasn't even public at that time. And, um, but it's critically important. It produces one of the two most important benchmarks in the world, the price of crude oil. And, um, uh, you know, after 9-11, uh, it was the first, one of the first two businesses that the U.S. government wanted open. Like there were executives being flown over in military helicopters, like to open up the NYMEX. Because if you don't have, it's kind of why I chose exchanges as my, my entree into finance. Like they were incredibly cool institutions. Like they're the, the epicenter of all financial activity. Like if exchanges break down, if pricing breaks down, all of finance breaks down because you, you can't price anything. You can't, all loans go away, all equity values go away. And so I'm a huge fan of exchanges. I'm very, I'm very romantic about them. Um, so NYMEX was critically important. Uh, I travel around the world from NYMEX. They would always send me around the world to these places and they were always, you know, hyper, hyper cybersecurity sensitive. And my first time to the, to the Middle East, uh, I came back and this was back in the days where you would plug your computer into a LAN in the, in the hotel. Um, I came back and the CIA and FBI visited the IMX uh, because we had a DDoS attack against our website and they traced it to my laptop. And they couldn't figure out exactly where, but they, it was somewhere in my travels. They weren't sure if it was when I went to China, UAE, but they said somebody, somebody basically ghosted your laptop when you plugged it into the LAN. And they hijacked it and they used it as part of a DDoS attack against the NYMEX's website. And, and again, this, this elevated to like the DOJ level, like, because this is a critically important institution. And so we had meetings with the CIA and they took my laptop and they interviewed me and they were like trying to figure out what's going on. And then when we started doing the, 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 the deal in Dubai, there were folks who were just not that excited about it. They were just, you know, this, this, if you think about it, like, and this is why I think the UAE was so prescient and so forward thinking, and I give credit to the NYMEX guys as well. Um, exchanges are the epitome of capitalism, right? There was nothing, there's nothing more capitalist than a free market to set the price of something. It is the exact opposite of autocracy. Of, of dictation by fiat. Um, for the UAE back then, again, 2002, to say, we are gonna allow a Western capitalist mechanism, the Westernist capitalistic of mechanisms to price crude oil, of all things, was, was really extraordinary. Economic wise, it was a small, they were, put, they were putting a billion dollar hotels every day back then, like it was nothing. This was like a $125 million equity deal. It was, it was peanuts to them. But they understood the critical importance. I remember when, when the, the delegation came over and I took them to the floor of the NYMEX, which back then was pre-electronic trading, just guys screaming and yelling, like the movie Trading Places. Yeah, it was it. filmed on the floor of the NYMEX, actually. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, the movie was filmed on the floor there. That was the commodities exchange. <laughs> Oranges. Orange, orange juice. juice. Yeah, they had, we had an OJ, but I'm the other, the COMEX. Please uh, tell, like, so yeah. we've got this ongoing thing yeah. where basically Danny hasn't seen any good films. And he's got this fucking terrible taste. He always recommends films, but they're on their shit. <sighs> Please, please tell me you've seen Trading Places. Oh, I think part of the problem is I never remember the films I've seen, but I'm pretty sure I've seen that. Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy. Yeah, I He's think a I've homeless seen guy. It. I think yes. I've seen it. You've seen it, haven't you? Yeah. Phew. Yeah. <laughs> Forgive him. The two films to learn about finance: The Big Short and Trading Places. That's that'll cover everything. You're good. Yeah. Yeah. So D Danny yeah. only just saw Back to the Future. 
Oh no! It, was, it wasn't that bad. I watched Back to the Future two though on the way here. It wasn't and that it was bad. Back is that to how the you just described it. Why That's do you good. think it's really good? It what? It's like are you similar age to me? Yeah, how mid, you... mid 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 no, forties. Yeah, uh, yeah. But Back to the Future two was terrible. So I, I don't know. That's fair. Have That's you fair. have you seen Tough Back to the Future two recently? No, but I can. I'm picturing it in my head, and I know it'd be cringy. It didn't age well. Yeah, yeah. So the, yeah. the thing was when we had Back to the Future, brilliant. Yeah. Back to the Future Two was set in the future, to us ah, at right. the time. So you're like the oh, hoverboard. Wow. Yeah, the hoverboard. They yeah. wear cool clothes. Now when you look at it, it's like, I can we never dress like Dumb. that. And and it just didn't. It hasn't aged well. And it was based in like 2015. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dumb. Yeah. Dumb. Dumb. Whereas yeah. Back to the Future, uh, the first one was set in the past. So it's historically correct because they wore the clothes that people would have worn at that time. And I think that's right. I think Terminate, right. Terminator and Terminator 2 have a similar issue. Yeah, and Jaw the Jaws movies yeah. like jumped off a cliff, right? So yeah, just ignore ignore the derivatives and just go, you know, back to commodities. Just ignore the derivatives and go to the spot. Yeah. Right? That's where the action is. Yeah. <laughs> Jaws is the same though. Like I Yeah. I don't mind that movie, but just the special effects are terrible. Like you can't. The first Jaws is brilliant. Still but we, we used to like camp back then. Like just saying, like the, 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 the cheesy bad special effects were part of the charm. Yeah. But they were give, they but were yeah, they think like the early time. metaverse. Our movies were like early metaverse. Right? It's clunky, it's but like you kind of see the potential and the clunkiness is part of the charm. I think I think the thing about yeah. Jaws is is it's not about when you see the shark, the tensions yeah. when you don't see the shark. Yeah. Yes. Stirred and <laughs> yeah. That's that's the tension and yeah. I think uh, Spielberg was a master there. Yeah. Absolutely killed it. And and believing that a shark would follow from New York to the Bahamas. Yeah. Which was the premise of Jaws 4, I think. Yeah. So it's, oh, it's, it's the suspension I've not, of this. I've definitely not seen Jaws 4. <laughs> I mean I mean Jaws 2 Jaws 2 is kind of interesting. Then it was like Jaws 3D. Yeah. Then it was like, dude, yeah. to take your family and move to Wisconsin, like get inland. Yeah. Like this is the plot the holes are just too much. Well, I'm glad you've uh, I'm glad yeah. you've seen trading places. <laughs> So, okay, so back to you okay. guys. So, um, so yeah, so, so uh, this was incredibly, um, I, I, I'll, I'll forever be indebted because it was the most interesting thing done, I've done in my career. I'll be forever indebted to the, the forward looking uh, nature of the UAE government to, to realize we need this. So they came to New York and I told them about like, you know, after 9-11, like this was the, and they, they, they saw the floor of the exchange and, they, and they, they got it. They said, okay, we want to build a financial center that's globally respected. And I, I told them a story about when I was traveling to China, I'm in rural China, turn the TV on the hotel, no English channels, I see NYMEX crude oil prices. And I remember the guy from Dubai, I remember his eyes getting big. He was like, I want the world to see prices emanating from Dubai. That's what makes a financial center a financial center is, is information emanates. Now we, we may move eventually to a world of purely de pure decentralization where none of this matters. I don't think it'll happen purely in my lifetime. So for at least a few more lifetimes, I think um, sources matter. Um, so the source of truth for what a price of crude oil is comes out of back then only New York. Now it's New York and Brent. Um, and you, I said, you should want that. You, oh, most of the oil comes from your part of the world. Why shouldn't you own that pricing as well? And he got it, man. And he said, wait till you come to my gold souk. You'll understand. And when I took the NYMEX board guys who were very skeptical, I took up the gold souk in Dubai and they looked around. They were like, oh, shit, this is the NYMEX floor. These guys get it. They're traders. They understand. There's like a hundred, a thousand guys screaming and yelling, setting, setting gold prices at the souk in Dubai. So, so, um, but there were some folks who didn't like this idea. Um, and uh, the, we were warned. We were warned, like, you know, there's gonna be people who don't like it. And they, they, they give you what's called K&R insurance and kidnapping ransom and K&R training. And they tell you, they say, okay, here's, here's what happens. There's a lot, most, most kidnappings are economic in nature. And they, t they tell you, they give you, that here's characteristics that it's an economic kidnapping. And if that's the case, you don't fight. You don't fight because they'll call us, we'll negotiate a fee and you'll be released. Like that's how it works. And then they tell you if it's, they give you hints if it's non-economic, if it's um, political or religious or whatnot. And then it's like the advice, I don't know if you dive, but the advice is like, if you get attacked by a shark, um, if it's a bull shark, fight like hell. Other sharks tend to nip and then go away, um, quietly move away, try not to be like a fish. But if it's a bull shark or a bear, fight like hell because they're going to kill you. Just out of interest, how do you fight a shark? Uh, gills, eyes, okay, and gills. Don't, don't try to punch it, punch uh, it the the, the, there's a myth that they are sensitive in the nose that they have they have they have a mass of uh of uh, of nerves but but they have fat around it so punching a shark in the nose then that you're gonna if you try you'll miss and your fist will probably go in the mouth and it'll tear your arm off so I, if you can hook the gills uh they're sensitive there uh because you cut their breathing off so if you get your hands in their gills you could they get 
and they want to shake off to to breathe. And then obviously you can gouge their eyes if you can. I mean, ideally, you know, really it's just about trying to make yourself harder. And then bear, I think you're supposed to cover your neck and go in a ball. I mean, it's, um, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to go yeah. into training for that. It's not no, 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 no real sharp fighting. Especially but. now, remember, I knew how I acted in life or death situations, and I turned into a puddle, right? So I'm not, you know, <laughs> so, uh, so. But anyway, um, just uh, out of interest, yeah, did yeah, I ever tell you yeah. the bear bear story? You have a bear story? I don't think so. Uh, no, I don't, I don't. I don't have a bear story as yeah. such. It was more just kind of funny. So when I was out in Canada, I was like, like on my own, traveling around and just going going for walks and checking stuff out. And there was like signs for warnings of bears. And so my my mate was out there. I was like, "How serious is this?" He's no, it's like it's serious. Bears find people, and and they will attack and they'll kill. I was like, "Oh shit!" He was like, "But this is what you need to do." And I, I might get it the wrong way around. But he said, "If it's a black bear, you have to uh, stand up and be loud and noisy." I think that's right. And yeah. if it's a brown bear, cover you have up, to cover up into a ball. Yeah. I was like, "Okay." So he said, "Just one warning: black bears can be brown, and brown bears can be black." <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck do you do with that then? <laughs> I think you just you just I think the proper position is to bend over, put your head between your legs, and kiss your ass goodbye. I really think that's kind of it. I think we, we tell ourselves these things to make ourselves feel like we're in control. The reality is, uh, if a raccoon attacked you, like there's a decent chance it's taking you down. <laughs> Connor jumped up with a cockroach last night, <laughs> the size of my thumb. <laughs> Let out a little. Wobble. I get it, man. I get it. You once here fly. He heard the the once here fly. At least in New York, they stay on the ground. In Miami, you go to squish it, and it could fly up in your face. So you had the right instinct. <laughs> you were brave. I was really proud of you. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Shh. Don't tell anyone, Connor. It's all I secret. All right, so anyway. Yeah. So long, long story short, um, I, I really don't love talking about this because this kind of brings back some bad memories, but um, uh, I was in a, I was in a, not in the UAE. It was a different part of the world, working on the project, and um, was really stupid and forgot all the training and had a driver and went downstairs and it was a different guy and he said, oh, it's my my cousin, um, he couldn't make it and um, like an idiot, I got in the car and was on my BlackBerry. So long ago it was and um, wasn't paying attention and all of a sudden we were not in the city anymore and um, I was like, what wh wh where are we going? And he said, shut up. And uh, it became real very, very fast. Um, the rest of the story, that's actually the most exciting part. The rest of the story was like shockingly, I was very, very lucky that it was a, it was the former type and it was a ransom negotiation with the K&R company. And um, they knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, there were some things, some signs that I was going to be okay. I saw women. I was in the Middle East. I saw women. So that indicated I was not in a being, they, they talk about, they tell you, they teach you about uh, if you get to increasingly, if they trade you, to increasingly rural places, and there's no women, not a good sign. Um, so there were women, there were women, um, and there were other people. I was in like a village. So um, it was an indication, and the other people were seeing me, and were seeing them with me. And uh, they just kept me in a room. Uh, they did show me a weapon to say, don't do anything stupid. But I, was, I wasn't beaten, I wasn't, uh, they fed me, I wasn't spoken to in a way. They didn't ask questions about the project, they didn't ask questions about my beliefs. So everything, the, tra the training was actually really, really good because it kept me from doing something dumb, um, which would have been the only way I think I would have gotten hurt in that, in that situation. And, uh, you know, you don't sleep, um, at least I didn't sleep. Um, and, uh, and they always give me lots of tea, which has a lot of caffeine, the, <laughs> that, that tea. And, um, and yeah, this is all in the book that that guy wrote about me. And um, uh, uh, I want to say 36, no, maybe 48, about 48 hours later, um, it was one, there was one point where they came in and they were like, you need to make a phone call. They got, the only thing they got angry was I think they just weren't, you know, they're, they're, they were negotiating. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a big shot. So like there was the, the, the company was negotiating and, and uh, I guess they got frustrated with the negotiations. They came in at one point and they handed me a phone and they were like, you need to call someone who loves you and you need to tell them that this is serious. And that was the part where it went from like, surreal, I can't believe this is happening, but hey, everything's happening the way I was told it would happen. Um, and that's a good sign to, uh, it was a brief moment where I was like, wow, that's like, cause, cause honestly, Peter, like what I was thinking was, I, yeah, I have people who love me, but I don't have anyone who can write, at that point in my life, I had no one who could write a huge check. So I'm thinking, okay, if my, if a loved one calls the insurance company, they're not going to give a shit. <laughs> I'm sure they get that all the time. So really what that guy was telling me was, you better call someone who has a lot of money. And I didn't know anyone with lots of money. 
I guess I could have called him, I could have called the chairman of the NYMEX, but um, I didn't. I didn't feel at that point in my life I had I'd, anyone cared about me enough to write a huge check for me, and so that's that was the um, that was the only moment that I was like really wound. But then then it was weird. He left, and then somebody else came in like ten seconds later and said, "Give me the phone." Like like obviously that guy who did that wasn't supposed to do that. So they were fighting amongst themselves about best way, and then and then uh, they reached a, a bid ass spread. And so a market maker came in and <laughs> hit the bid. And um, uh, they put me in a car and they took me two blocks away from the US embassy. And so the embassy is that way because um, they had taken my passport. Wow. And, uh, and then um, that was it. And yeah. were you done with the UAE at that point? Well, again, it wasn't the UAE. Oh, was that? Sorry, Not the UAE. UAE. Wherever you were. Sorry, wherever you were. No, no. Um, I think like those, uh, those people get bit by sharks and go back in the water. Um, I, um, I, uh, I think that was a lightning strike type situation. Um, uh, you know, I, pro I processed that. I processed that better than the fake kidnapping, because my buddy. I remember my buddy who was a lot older, wiser, and, and more successful than me. Uh, I was stressing about it. I was I thought I was scared to go back, and he said, he said to me, um, you know, Johnny, you're you're not. People just call me Johnny back then. He goes, Johnny, you're um, you're nobody until somebody sues you, and you're really nobody until somebody tries to kidnap you. And so he convinced me that like I was doing something important with my life. And then he said to me, you're always talking about stories. He's like, holy shit, you got a, you got a story, man. And, um, and I was like, I don't wanna be a hypocrite. Like I, I preach this gospel of he who dies with the best stories wins. And now I'm gonna shit my pants and not lead an interesting life because, uh, because of this. So, so what, yeah. what, what was the shift that led to? What, what came after? Sorry? So what was the shift afterwards? Like how did that change you? So I think I am... Um, I developed a, a, a less, I had a higher risk tolerance at that point. Um, I, I think when you grow up without, I think when you grow up without money, you're naturally conservative. At least that's what, that was my take. Like I was naturally conservative. Like um, I was, a, I'm a saver. I've always been a saver. It doesn't matter if I, if I wind up creating tremendous wealth, I'll still be the, 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 the billionaire with, I don't think I'll be a billionaire, but like if I ever create tremendous wealth, I'll probably save 90% of it. Um, that's just how I grew up. Like f parents fighting about bills. And so I, I just save. Uh, and then that bled over into my, my life. I took risks with my career because the, I think a benefit of not having money growing up is I don't need it. So even though I had the opportunity to make a lot more money after HBS, um, I could optimize for stories because I, I was I, like, I'll live in the studio the rest of my life. Like I have kids now that that changes a bit, but I want more for them. Yeah, I don't know. It's I a see, superpower. I see it slightly yeah. differently. So uh, I grew up, my parents didn't have much money. My dad put everything into our schooling. So we yeah. just didn't have a lot. And yeah. and so I'm used to not having money and, and I, I've I've never been wealthy. I've done okay, yeah. but I just spend the shit out of it because really? if I went, yeah, because I'm, I'm not worried about going back to zero. Like schooling's done for mm. one kid, and the other one's nearly done, mm. and so I, I, I think I could go back to zero and have a job in a cafe and still be happy. Like I'm always yeah. happy. The money. Yeah. I think what it was is at one point having money, I was miserable, and so I never equated the two. So mm. I'm, I don't save. I'm the opposite. I spend money on stupid shit all the time. Huh. I think that's great. Look, I, 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 I don't, I don't think I optimize for enjoyment of my life. So I envy people who. I mean, the, the, right, the right answer is probably in the middle, right? Somewhere. Well, if you optimize but, yeah. for enjoyment, yeah. you're also optimizing for stories because you're, yeah, you're putting the money so you can go and do stupid shit. Yeah, that's a different way. You're right. Yeah. That's a fair point. That's a that's a fair point. You can get you can achieve those stories through um, through uh, zero savings. That's yeah. that's Activities fair. Activities and yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I have no, I have no. I don't think I have a better way of. Of, I, have a, I have a bad relationship with money because of how I grew up. So I know that. So I don't, I don't think I have a better, I don't give money advice because I don't think I have a good relationship with money. Um, but however you achieve those stories, good for you. That's, that's great. For me, I'm more, I'm more open to stories if I know I have some savings in the bank. If I have that cushion, then I'm more willing to take that risk. Um, but, I love risk. But whatever way is, is whatever, whatever works, as long as, as long as you just lead a, lead a fucking interesting life. Like there's nothing worse than like sitting next to somebody who's achieved monetary success at a party and they have no good stories to tell. What a fucking waste. Yeah. Like your stories can, by the way, your stories don't have to be like my crazy stories. They could be like, I just, like, like Ray Chambers. I'll, I'll, I'll throw him out there. Ray Chambers, legendary icon in the investment industry, founder of Reservoir Capital, met this guy on vacation. Baller life. I met him on Necker Island. Like I got a free trip. He did. You've like, been to Necker? What is Necker? Yeah. That's uh, Richard yeah. Branson's island. I got. I got. I got invited. I got invited to speak there. Um, yeah. Whenever you've been yeah. to Necker, you've made it. Yeah. But I, I was. I was <laughs> a freebie. Kidnapped. I got invited to speak there. But I met. I meet Ray Chambers on Necker. I met the most amazing people on Necker. I got. I got married by Desmond Tutu because of my Necker trip. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you mean Desmond Tutu yeah. married you? Yeah.
he was he was there. And I, so I was gonna propose to my wife, my girlfriend at the time, and I had it all set. I was, I was gonna propose on the steps of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. It was always my favorite spot in New York. At night, lit up, the steps, beautiful. I got engaged in New York. Yeah, I had it all set up. And then six weeks before I was gonna propose, I get invited to speak at a conference on Necker Island. And I'm like, fuck the steps of the Met. I'm like, because yeah. they let my girlfriend come. And I'm, I'm proposed there. And Tutu was on the island. And <laughs> I proposed the first night. And when you, when you propose, you become the center of attention. And I don't know if I can call her out. Yeah, you know, I'm, why not? She's amazing. Queen Noor of Jordan was on the island. <laughs> she saw me for, now the island, when you're on the island, you're part of this little home. You're small. I may, I may be breaking all the rules, but um, uh, whatever. I think it's a great story. I think it was, she was lovely. So she saw us. She saw us getting engaged, and she's an amazing woman. And she like befriended my wife, um, and she um, for that trip at least. And then Tutu was there, and she said, "Tutu, you should marry them. You should marry them. You should marry them." And uh, there's very few people. When people say Clintons like this. Very few people that uh, Mandela I've heard. I've not met any of them. I met Tutu. That when they speak to you, even if you're not religious, you feel God. Yeah. I'm not religious. I felt God. The guy was, uh, God rest his soul, he was an unbelievable, unbelievable man. And he, um, the next morning, we were on the beach, and she kept bugging him, to marry them, to marry them. And he says, okay. And everyone gathered around. Someone pulled out a phone, and, they, and he took us on the, in the water. He was wearing shorts. <laughs> we were in bathing suits. And he married us. I mean, not, like, obviously not entirely officially, but he did a, wedding, a little mini wedding ceremony. Oh, yeah. my God, my stories are so shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I was just on Necker Island, got married by a tutu. Yeah. Um, but my point is like, so I, I got to Necker, I got the free invite to Necker because I agreed to do the book. Yeah. I agreed to do the book because I agreed to take the job that everyone at Harvard Business School said you were insane to take, the NYMEX. Who the hell went to the NYMEX? NYMEX was a bunch of degenerate oil traders. Um, and so I'm not going to be the wealthiest guy from my class at HBS, but I, th I do think I'll have the best stories. You've got to put yourself in situations. Yeah. That's yeah. what it is. Um, yeah. So about, uh, it was about six years ago, just after I got divorced, I quit advertising, quit the advertising industry. And um, I was just running a lot and I was listening to the podcast by this guy. Everyone who's listened to the podcast heard this story many times. You were times. running, physically running. Physically running. Okay. I used to run every day. Just, okay. just uh, it was like a therapy. And I Google the guy and he's running a retreat in Italy, like a yoga retreat with his wife. He's mm -hmm. American. Um yeah, it's rich roll anyway. And so I was like, I think I need to be there. So I phoned up. They're like, we've got one place left. So I went, got there, did the retreat. It's so pre kids, right? Uh, no, no. Connor was um, about 12. That's awesome, yeah. by the way. It's awesome. I so many went, people, they, they de risk when they have kids. It's bad for the kids, bad for the dad. But sorry, go ahead. No, we, we risk yeah. more. Um, and then um, and I went on the uh, trip. And at the end of it, Rich was like, oh, I hope you had a good time. If you're ever in LA, like, uh, let me know. So I'm like, fuck this. So I booked the flight to LA. I'm like, I'm here. And I turned up. I said, I think you got the best job in the world. You're a podcaster. I love it. How do you do it? He said, buy this equipment. So I went back to my buddy's place in Santa Monica, bought the equipment, phoned up Luke Martin, said, I want to make a podcast, and just did it. And so what I found with this is just constantly put yourself in situations. Go to places. What's that thing? Is it the Yes Project you told me about, Con? Yes theory. It's like, this, yeah. you know about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a movie, a kid's movie called Yes Day, ah. where you say yes to everything the kids want for a day. Right. Kids so, love it, yeah. And so I've, I've just yeah. always, I've always said, put yourself in situations, yeah. right? Can you buy a football team? Yes, buy a football, let's do it. There's a bar yeah. available, buy it. Like, just constantly do shit. Yeah. And because of that, stuff happens. Yeah. Like, m when, you, when you talk about manifesting stuff, <clears throat> there isn't like some magic in the universe that happens. Nope. Goes, well done for that. The manifesting is just making shit happen. Just, That's right. It's like Danny. Danny one day just thought, you know, I'm going to email Pete. Danny emails me and says, I think you're production. He told shit. me a story. Amazing. Yeah. Awesome. And, and I'm, and it's I'm, physics. Yeah. Inertia. Action begets action. And Inertia. Bodies at rest tend to stay at rest. Bodies in motion tend to stay in motion. Make something fucking, make something happen. Anything. And now we've traveled the world together making this yeah. show. Connor. Yeah. Connor um, uh, said he was, he's bored of uni. Do you mind me talking about this? He said I've, he came home and I knew he wasn't, I knew he wasn't enjoying it. And then I could see him like wandering around and. I was like, what's the matter? He's like, uh, I'm behind on my work. I said, do you care about it? He's like, no. I was like, that's why you've not done it. Yeah. I was like, you can quit. I said, you've got another option. You can come out to Miami in a few weeks with me and Danny. You can learn production, become part of the show now. Yeah. Now he's taking action. He's he's here doing this. And and it's like, so I, I always nice. say to people, it's like, yeah. 
you know, yes, there's luck in life. Of course there is. But if you keep putting yourself out there, you keep saying yes, going to places, doing stuff, stuff will work out. Connor, it's such great advice. And it's not, by the way, it's not carpe diem. I fucking hate carpe diem. It's not that. Carpe diem is selfish, irrational, and silly. This is about taking smart, thoughtful risks that put yourself in a position to be happy. And if you're happy, here's a quick story for you. Um, I went to Harvard Business School. I was super lucky to go. And anyone who says they're not lucky to get into a place like that is fucking delusional because if the person reading my essay had a bad day that day, I wouldn't have gone in. Not the smartest guy there at all, but I had a friend. I know I'm, I was smarter than that friend. I had more intellectual horsepower than that friend. We took, second year, I took a fixed income bond pricing course. Boring. I couldn't fucking stand it. Bored out of my mind. He crushed me in that class because he genuinely, bizarrely, annoyingly, he loved doing bond pricing. And I realized something, like, unless you're lucky enough to be a true savant, like unless you're just at a different gamma level intelligence, which 99.99% .99 of us are not, even if you have more intellectual horsepower, even if you work harder than someone, they're gonna beat you if they enjoy what they do. That's carpe diem to me. It's practical. It's not this air in the sky bullshit. Like, because by the way, whatever you choose, you're gonna hate parts of it. There's grunt work in everything. It's, it's not carpe diem. It's not do what you love all the time. That's bullshit. But if you don't have an underlying path, it purely, for me, it's purely practical. You will not be, you will not win and be competitive if you hate, if you wake up every day just with a pit in your stomach as to what you're going to need to do. And so when, when yeah. I recognize that when you're on Twitter and there's people just fucking yelling in your day, and, and I think these people, <laughs> that what, what's really happened yeah. is they haven't gone out and manifested what they want. Again, not in a hippie way. Yeah. They're miserable. Yeah. You know, that's why they're on there. They're like, fuck you, fuck this, you're shit, you're fat. Like, it's because they're miserable. And I just think everyone could just go out there, just go yeah. and do the shit you want and just and just make it happen. And, yeah. you know, and, and, and I've seen so many people do it, but just go out there and make it happen. Yes, just say yes to everything. I also think it's just the, it's, you know, I'm not, not advocating violence, but but I did grow up in a time where if you said that to somebody to their face, they'd punch you right in the face. And I, I think a lot of these guys on Twitter need to be punched in the face just once. I don't want them to get hurt. <laughs> I just want to sting. Um, because they're just, I remember when there was consequences to being a complete and utter prick. And um, what was the Tyson I feel like quote? there should be. Everyone, everyone has a plan as so they get punched in the face. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so where's, the, okay, come on, where's the Bitcoin connection? There's going to be people. Whatever, the shift. Where, how, how long are we in? Forty minutes. Someone's going oh, to. Sorry. Like, first, okay. the first comments. Okay, so, be so I'm a tradfi guy. So much, I'm a tradfi guy, but um, always yeah, I was in derivatives. So I was always I was always like idiosyncratic stuff, like wacky stuff. Um, uh, my advice to young people is always like learn about the weird stuff, and you'll always have a job. So um, I, uh, I I've, I've taught at Columbia and MIT for a while. Uh, I'm not a professor. I'm a lecturer. <laughs> There's a lot of folks who lecture pretend they're professors. But being in that, being in, at MIT in Columbia, just being around, you get to see the cool technology stuff. That's why I do it. I do it so uh, my, my, my trade with the business school is I'll teach for free, but I want to become buddies with the nerds because that, that's where all the power is. And so I, I made all these friends at the Connection Sciences Lab and, and Media, Science, Media Lab. And so um, I want to stay relevant. So over a decade ago, I said, okay, I, I have friends at, in, at the regulators. I want the regulators to like me. And so I started, I cut a deal. I was like, I told the regulators, I will do research in cutting edge technology that impacts financial markets, not just crypto, AI, low latency trading. I'll, I'll do it at MIT, I'll do it at Columbia, we'll teach it as a class, and then I'll bring that research and those professors to the regulators. So I've um, been doing that for 10 years. And uh, crypto was obviously something everyone was interested in a while ago. And so uh, I wrote a paper with a friend of mine at MIT on the DAO hack, the original DAO hack that sparked the Ethereum uh, chain. Uh, um, and I, uh, the paper got the attention of some pretty big folks in crypto, early OGs. And I won't, I won't name drop them, but um, uh, one of them who had a big, 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 big fund called me and said, hey, I read your paper. And I, I call myself a cynical enthusiast in the paper about crypto. And um, he said, I'm, I'm, I got too many enthusiasts around me. I need some cynical enthusiasts. I don't want cynics. Uh, they're useless, but the enthusiasts are also kind of useless. I need, I need this. And so I joined the board of, of that very prestigious uh, crypto uh, VC and hedge fund. And what better place to learn? I mean, so I just, I just developed, um, uh, you know what? Actually, it's public information. It's on their ADV, so it's polychain. Okay. And um, with, um, oh, what's his name? Um, uh, Carson? Yeah, Olaf, yeah. Olaf. Yeah, yeah. So amazing place to learn, amazing place to, to um, you know, so between, I had the MIT guys who could, uh, the best thing about having a bunch of really, really smart nerds on your, and I, mean, I say that with all love, by the way. I love, I love my nerds. Um, 
it, having them on like a WhatsApp group is amazing because whenever I get some bullshit pitch about what a technology can or cannot do, I've got like 50 people I can just text and they'll just send me a thumbs up or thumbs down emoji. Um, and I can call bullshit on any of that stuff immediately, like with good, ver with good verification. Um, so that was the shift into crypto. So I got to learn in an amazing place, yeah. being on the board of, uh, of this fund. And, um, and then Coinbase called me. Yeah, yeah. Crypt crypto is a bad word around these parts. Uh, these parts being this show or? Yeah. It's, oh. Yeah. Like they're going to be like, was he talking about crypto for? This is a Bitcoin I'm sorry. Show. I'm Bitcoin. Sorry. Um, <laughs> just, just pre warning. You. I understand. I, I, I've been, pre I'm, I'm prepped for getting flamed. Um, <laughs> look, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, humbly, I am, I am the TradFi crossover person that I do think the sector um, should help ease into this. Uh, so forgive me if I've, uh, if I've used a, an appropriate word. Um, uh, so, but um, because my background's in exchanges, yeah. Uh, when I got the call from Coinbase, um, again, I, be I believe exchanges are critically important economic pieces of economic infrastructure. Um, I know exchanges pretty well. Uh, I had gotten uh, learned enough about uh, digital assets, Bitcoin, crypto, to become uh, dangerous through my time with Polychain, and uh, it just was a natural fit. And then I, and then lastly, whenever you have an idiosyncratic volatile asset class, I think you have to bet on people. And I really respected uh, Brian and the people, uh, Brett and Greg, and the folks who run institutional at, uh, at Coinbase. Yeah, it's, Coinbase yeah. is an interesting one. It's, yeah. it's it's kind of like a weird paradox that goes on for me with them because. There's a, they've received heavy criticism in the past for their, certainly from the Bitcoin community, for their focus sure. on yep. uh, other chains and crypto yep. and less of a dedication to Bitcoin, which I think some of it's fair. Yep. But at the same time, like I'm really aware you know, how much Coinbase has done behind the scenes to hold off the freight train of regulation and bad regulation, which I think not everyone is aware about, but I'm aware they've done Absolutely. a lot in the background to just keep that freight train from running over this industry. Yeah. What, what is it you, can you say what you do for them? Yeah, sure, I work, I work for strategies. I used to be head of strategy for NYMEX, so I'm not head of strategy for, for Coinbase Institutional, but that's the function I serve in is, is strategy. We don't really have a head of strategy, but I work for Brett and Greg, head of institutional, and I help them think through the same problems I help NYMEX think through, like where should we be in the world? How do we get more institutional investors to, to get on chain? Um, and just help build the institutional business. So okay. in doing that, having come from a traditional yep. traffic world and coming into this, um, and I'm really <laughs> stealing Danny's question, but what you're coming, I'm stealing it from you. No, no, that's all right. Well, the, the big question I had is like, how immature did this seem when you like came into it as a space? Yeah, so I, I didn't, uh, you know, a lot of folks, a lot of folks in, can I can I keep saying in crypto or in Bitcoin? What do I want to say here? You no, know, I mean if you're describing them, which, yeah, yeah. But, so a lot of folks in crypto will say uh, we're in the first inning. Oh, we're so early. We're so. I actually don't like that. I'll be honest, because mm -hmm. it's it's the technology is ten to fifteen years old. So I, I think you have to acknowledge we're not in the first inning. Yeah. Um, I don't even like the analogy. I don't know what inning we're in. I mean, so uh, there's still there's still uh, people are still educating on commodity derivatives, which is a thirty year old thing. Yeah. So so I, I I don't find that discussion useful. Um, just, just from a numbers perspective, like there is a smaller percentage of institutional investors who engage in this asset class than other idiosyncratic asset classes like derivatives, like swaptions, like all that stuff. So, so I think we are, we are under, uh, under engaged. I, I think of it that way. Now that could be good and bad, right? Um, it could be, it's good if we're under engaged because either the asset class is not ready and will, and will come ready or institutions aren't aware of the asset class. Problem that crypto has is um, it's utilized, it's eaten up a lot of airspace. My mother knows where crypto is, mm -hmm. and my mother still can't change the time on her microwave. And and that is good and bad. The bad part of that, the good part of that, obviously, is people know about it. That's great. The bad part is people know. And so if they've decided to not engage at this point, it becomes a harder sell because they've already made up their minds about the asset class. So um, I think for institutions, um, you know, this notion that they're naturally going to engage. That's not true. We have to work at it. Like there are a lot of institutions that don't trade commodity derivatives. They just, I remember my early days at NYMEX, um, we, had, we, we launched a jet fuel contract um, and we were uh, talking to the airlines and we were like, hey, you should use, we have this amazing thing that you can hedge your jet fuel exposure. And they were like, you talk to these CFOs, we're not dumb people. And they'd be like, ah, oh, you know, we, we don't, we don't spec, we're not in the business of speculating on commodities. I'm like, well, dude, if you don't, you're short jet fuel, you have to buy it. Mm -hmm. If you don't hedge, you're speculating. That's the whole fucking point. And it was very, very frustrating. And eventually they came on, but it took a long time. 
And there's a lot of firms that like use natural gas to bake, you know, their ovens, like companies that make muffins. And they don't, they don't hedge. And it's insane. They just don't do it. But because they just view that as another thing, this complex, crazy derivative space. So, so I don't buy the, I don't think the early, early inning narrative is helpful. I don't think the everyone who doesn't do it is a Luddite and doesn't get it narrative is helpful. Maybe that was the case five, 10 years ago. They're not dumb. Mm -hmm. um, when we speak about regulators, when we speak about folks who've chosen to not engage in the sector, if we just say, oh, they're all dumb, they just don't get it, they don't see the future, um, it's self-defeating. Um, it didn't work It didn't work when we tried to sell derivatives on people, and it's not gonna work when we try to sell digital assets, um, engagement in digital assets. So, so um, I will say that what made me optimistic enough to wanna work with a firm like Coinbase in the institutional uh, section is I think that appetite is there. I do think it's the former. I think I think it's they're waiting. The ones who are not, some just will never. Some will just never engage, and of we have course. to be okay with that. Just like some never trade derivatives. Um, but but there's a a pretty big chunk of institutional activity, especially hedge funds that just seek out alpha, that they're just waiting for this asset class to have all the bells and whistles they need to trade it in a regulated manner because they themselves are regulated. No so, different from commodities. So they're waiting on regulation or new tools that we don't have yet. They're, they're waiting on some degree of regulation. Um, they're, they're also, they're okay with opaque and opaque regulatory. If the other stuff is there, they're okay. I mean, there are things like, there's like this wacky thing in fixed income called season and sell, mm -hmm. um, which is if you, if you're in the credit market and you have offshore investors and you buy something in the US that produces uh, what's called ECI, effectively connected, like rent. You buy an apartment building that, that pays rent into it. That's taxable US income. And, but you have offshore investors, they don't wanna pay taxes. So what you do is you buy it and then you let it sit for 30 days or 60 days or like 90 days, and then you sell it to the offshore fund and magically it all goes away. And if you talk to a half of the attorneys you talk to go, that's bullshit. Other half go, yeah, yeah, it works. There's no, it's, it's, it's a relatively opaque area. There's no law, it's, like, there's no thing they can point to that says this is okay. Tomorrow the IRS could turn around and say, yeah, this is, that's, of course that's bullshit. Yeah. But everybody does it. So, so again, this notion that you have to have regulatory clarity, certainty is not true. You have to have more than what we have in crypto for sure. And you certainly, you can't have an adversarial regulator, which is unfortunately what we have right now. Um, but you can have some, some opaqueness. But if you have the opaqueness, you have to have the institutional infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You have to have the market makers, you have to have you know, the credibility, the, the, the clear counterparties, right? I'm not gonna take regulatory risk and idiosyncratic market risk. I'll take one or the other, but not both. Yeah. And then of course, the alpha has to be there. Like alpha solves everything. Just returns solve everything. <laughs> if you can make 500%, I'll get comfortable with the risk yeah. in some small way. So yeah. in that case then, what's happening now with like the Operation Choke Point and them closing down like banking for this, that must be a huge burden. For the US, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think look, I, I, I've always been in weird asset classes. So I'm, I'm used to regulatory arbitrage, right? You know, back in the day when I was at NYMEX, they had this thing called the, the NYMEX ICE Henry Hub ARP, which is because of idiosyncr idiosyncrasies in the way the US regulator and the UK regulator regulated natural gas options, there was this ARB that exists. You could buy New York, sell London, because they were fungible to each other, yeah. or vice versa. And you could lever that up, and you could lock in like at points like a 16% risk-free. Mm -hmm. Your risk was just to the relative exchanges, which were AAA. And that, that thing hung around for like a decade. Like ARBs are supposed to go away, it just because of it was based on, back then it mattered like the time of day. And it was based, so there's always, in complex asset classes, there are always regulatory nuances. Mm -hmm. I have never seen as wide of a spread as I see now between the rest of the world and the US. And what's really interesting is because the US is still, US is still the bellwether market. It is still the, 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 the world's premier respected regulatory and most liquid capital market. And my concern would be because the US is so incredibly negative, um, that it would it would taint the rest of the world. They would say, oh, you know, we got to wait to the SEC. To, um, they're not. They're not. They, they were for a little bit, but now they've made a decision that they think the U.S. is wrong, and they are going. They think that the U.S. will eventually come to to reasonability, which I also think so. Um, and they think they're getting a year to eighteen month head start, and they're off to the races. So but, that means, therefore, you uh, as a business, your strategy is to make sure you corner those international markets. Yeah, I think, I mean, 
Coinbase has been public about, uh, especially recently, about it's, it's not leaving the U.S. by any means, but but I think the, um, you know, remember, N NYMEX lasted for 80 years before it had to go overseas. I think um, digital assets will have to move faster to, to again, to get, to, to, to build a pole position in those markets. Um, so, look, I think it's, if the U.S. was a fabulous regulatory environment, I would still be urging Coinbase to set up overseas. Every every major exchange in the world, Nice Euronex, Deutsche Borsa, CME, they all have um, they all have exchanges in Dubai or Abu Dhabi. They have them in London. They, you have you, you, these are fungibly global instruments. You have to be if you're an exchange and you want to trade a global instrument, you have to be overseas. Certainly, there's an increased urgency um, to to accelerate that uh, because of the uh, the way the the U.S. is approaching it. But um, but I'm optimistic. I do think the U.S. We, we, I think. I think we're wrong. I mean, it's maybe we're right and the rest of the world is wrong. Maybe, I don't think so. So I think eventually that'll become apparent and the US doesn't lose. We don't like to lose. So eventually we'll figure out how to save face and do maybe not a full about, I don't think we'll ever be as say enthusiastic as the UAE, but um, uh, I do think that it'll, it'll revert to the mean because I think we'll see the widening gap and we'll see the rest of the world saying, sorry, we love you guys, but we're all in. Yeah. And we will not give up that tax revenue. We will not give up that positioning. Um, and so I do think we'll come back to, to reasonability. Yeah, I'm finding mm -hmm. the expansion in or the adoption in South America quite yeah. interesting. Obviously, we have a very, yeah. I don't know, Central America, but we have a very good case study in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. um, we have various stories about politicians from Brazil, Argentina. Colombia, it's very Columbia, popular. Columbia. Columbia. It's very yeah. popular. And so I can see... <clears throat> I, can, I think I can see why it's happening. I mean, the U.S. has a, uh, a goal of defending its position as the global reserve currency, and everyone yeah. else has a need to get away from That's right. the U.S. Uh, because because they suffer from, you know, when there's massive inflation in the yeah. U.S., it compounds the issues for other countries who are buying their resources in the dollar. So yeah. uh, there's, a, there's yeah. a natural need to try and get away from that position. So I, th I think it's yeah. only natural. Uh, I think you're right. I think the U.S. is wrong on this i think the uk similarly is wrong on this and they, we will come back coming around the uk made a big u-turn last six to eight months i mean the new administration there the rishi administration is is night and day different from the previous administration of course there's no question i mean they're they're their fca is still lukewarm to positive but but way better than it was way better than it was six to eight months ago i, I the uk in my mind is doing what i think america will eventually do they're they're, they're returning they're 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 abandoning a untenable position for a thoughtful position. We could all maybe want to be a little more thoughtful, but but I I I, I love that I love that growth path over a sure, relatively short period of time. Um, and I hope the US follows suit. Yeah, and, and another concern on the US side is it seems to be nonpartisan. Yeah. Or yeah. Some bipartisan support for certain bills. Which, I don't know how we got here. Yeah, like, like it's so weird. Fight on. Let's literally fight on everything apart from this. I mean, we have politicians who who think that an anti crypto stance is a winning political strategy. I know. I mean, we have we have to take some blame for that as a community. Like we had to for it to get to that point, we have to be introspective and say, how did we get to a point where? Because these aren't stupid people, right? They they have polling. They have right. They, we can we can say they're all dumb. They're not. Like I still stand by. Like I, I don't like what the SEC is doing, but the people at the SEC, I, I know the rank and file staff. They're not dumb. They're not. They're they're smart, thoughtful people who are doing what they think is best. I, I maybe I'll get flamed for this, but I, I do think so. You will. Um, <laughs> uh, I, well, I, but I know some yeah, of them, yeah. and I know them. And and um, it depends who it is. You know, I mean, I, no, there's it, others who are. If it's Hester yeah. Purse, I'm with you. If it's Gary Gensler, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to say names, but like I I I, I, I maybe hopefully optimistic that there is thoughtfulness there. Because um, I know some of the people who still work there, and I have have presented to them over the years, and I know they're thoughtful because I've had drinks with them afterwards, and I know they're not closed-minded, and I know they're not dumb. Um, but it's uh, the zeitgeist, unfortunately, has just shifted from from the top down. Um, but yeah, I I I think that um, yeah, I, I I agree. It's it's unfortunate, but I am hopeless. I am a hopeless optimist about our country, and I I do think we eventually. You know, that's the old. The Brits say that about eventually Americans do the right thing, right? World War II, we that's what eventually do eventually we? we come around and do the right thing. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I hope so. Oh. I th but if only for self interest, because this is growing. This is growing in the rest of the world, and um, um, the narrative right now. So back to this like po political campaign about anti crypto. Um, they went and they did polling and the polling came back and said, this is, this is a good way to win hearts and minds. So how the hell did we get there? How did a technology and or asset class 
Like derivatives never got to this point. And by the way, I remember, I remember early NYMEX days, there was a conscious discussion. Why do we need this stuff? Why do we need crude oil derivatives? What the hell is this? This is all paper. This is nonsense. The same bullshit we're hearing about digital assets. I heard about uh, derivatives. They went to just, we don't just kill this whole thing. We don't need any of this stuff. Like that was a real conversation 20 years ago. But I kind of agree yeah. on something. I, like most of these digital assets, I don't think we need it. I think we need Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I think Bitcoin is very, very important. Uh, yeah. I don't think we need the other stuff, but that at the same time, I don't care if people want to fuck around with it and gamble with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know where the technology is going to go. I, I, I do see really cool stuff that can happen, unlocking value with NFTs between relationships. Um, when I first started at NYMEX, we made 90% of our money with commission trading, 10% with data sales. By the time I left, it was flipped. And so because we realized, oh, wow, you can, you can time slice data. And you can sell it in infinitely time, infinite time slices. So I think about like if Taylor Swift issued an NFT that could, if ownership of, of which allowed you to see her tweets five seconds for anybody else. I, 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 way smarter people than me are going to develop mechanisms using programmable, immutable instruments that convey ownership with possession, that are programmable and can link to digital experiences, that are going to unlock hundreds of billions of dollars of value, just like we unlocked hundreds of billions of dollars of value figuring out you can time slice data. So that's what makes, and I don't, I don't, mm. I, I want them to have those experiences. So let them, let them, I'm probably not going to do it, but just like I don't engage in, uh, I don't buy skins, but, but I just gave my daughter a gift card for Roblox to buy skins because it's the physical, you know what? Cause I'd be a fucking hypocrite if I didn't. Cause when I was her age, I made my parents buy me Z Cabaricis. Dude, I checked my yeah. bank account. It was about two years ago. I was, yeah. And I, I'm really bad at like finance. And I had to go to my bank account and find yeah. something. And I went in there and there was hundreds of pounds of these payments to Apple over and over again. I was like, what the hell is this? Yeah. I looked it up. Uh, I linked my daughter's uh, iPhone account to be able once because yeah. she wanted to buy something on Roblox. I didn't realize that, that left it left the channel open. Yeah. She spent hundreds of pounds buying skins for Roblox. Yeah, and I was like, and I sat down, Scott. I was like, Scott, can I talk to you about something? She said, Yeah. I said, You know, you like that game Roblox. She's like, Yeah. I said, Yeah. You know that time I let you buy that <laughs> giraffe skin? She's like, Yeah. I said, Did you press the button a few more times? <laughs> Instant floods of tears. She knew what yeah. she does. I was like, oh, don't worry about it. Then, she, yeah. then when she calmed down, she showed me and said, "But look at all these animals I've got." <laughs> yes, but and, and look, we have to teach them financial uh, good behavior, financial behaviors, but. What I realized is, so my, I made my parents buy me Z Cavaricis. Z Cavaricis, if, you, if you're from Brooklyn, if you're Italian from Brooklyn in the 1990s, you wanted Z Cavs. They were, like, remember MC Hammer? Of course. Cool. Remember yeah. those parachute pants he had? Yeah, yeah. Ugliest things in the world. 100 bucks in the 90s. My parents had no money. They got them for me. My mother made Wait, me take a photo. Pants. I wore them because that was the physical <laughs> manifestation of how I wanted to be perceived Please. as a young Italian male. She showed, she took a photo because she said, I want you to see how fucking stupid you look. We showed the photo at my wedding. I show the photo when I teach my class I on NFTs. I need to see this photo. Can we I'll put this photo on the video? Done. Here? I'll send it to you. <laughs> Done. And um, the reason is my, my, my daughter lives part of her life online. And those avatars are the physical manifestation of how she wants to be perceived by her friends. Mm -hmm. And it would be fucking hypocritical. And by the way, it's better than clothing. Because clothing degrades, child labor problems. It's, it's clothing is, is infinitely commoditized. Whereas theoretically, that, 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 that avatar, that skin could be uh, immutable and it could be rare. So, so it's not better than clothing. And so um, we have to teach them good financial skills because they, they're targeted in a predatory manner. Um, I explained to my daughter, uh, she's only nine, this is probably crazy. I explained to her that these companies hire behavioral psychologists to trick her into buying more. Um, but how stupid would we be if we didn't allow these kids to some degree, they should touch grass too, but to some degree, represent themselves the way we re represent ourselves with fucking ridiculous clothing. <laughs> I need to see this photo. <laughs> oh, it's, it's insane. I look, I look, yeah, I, I was just, I was, yeah, do you have guidos in England? Yeah, I guess lads would be your oh, yeah, equivalent okay. to guidos. Yeah, Brooklyn lads are called guidos. Uh, would that be like a scally? Yes. Well, scallies are northern. Is that? It would be, it would be, it would dress slightly differently, but the same concept. Yeah, yeah. The same concept. Like it's like, it's no, like, no, a scally would be yeah. like a chab. It's chavish. <laughs> it's chavish. It's chavish, but not a sporty. Yeah. 
Like, although we did, some times did do the whole Louis Vuitton, head to toe, yeah. Sergio Tacchini. It, it just, it was fucking awful. It was awful. Do, do you know um, the word chav is now seen as highly derogatory? Ooh. It? Yeah. It's now seen as, oh, oh, because shit. it's- You get me canceled? It's, Sorry, man. Yeah, no, because it, it's used to, um, it's almost uh, used to marginalize yeah, people from poorer backgrounds. Yeah. I could see that. Their clothes are expensive. <laughs> Gucci. <laughs> Knockoffs. So, John, what you yeah. got going on this week? So, uh, I just came to see you, Peter. Um, Thanks, no, look, I, I was talking to Danny before. I, um, I, I am here for the Miami BT. I, I don't, uh, Coinbase sends me, I'm, I'm the TradFi guy. I'm the crossover guy. So I do really well at like Milken. Um, I, I don't do as well <laughs> in, the, in the, your, your, your conference. Um, I was scared. I was, I was legitimately scared to talk to anyone. Cause I just, I don't do well. Cause it, the, you, you scared me just now. You said, you said crypto. Oh, you, yeah. you know, they're, gonna, they're all gonna come after I'm you on Twitter. I'm you, man. I'm just so like seriously. I'm so I'm I'm bad at Twitter. Like, am I gonna get uh, I, YouTube? Uh, YouTube. They'll be like, so two things are going to happen. Yeah. A bunch of people are going to go interview starts at forty minutes because they don't care about the bullshit at the start. And then okay. the other ones will be like, why is he said crypto? And then there's going to be like okay. NFTs, and they'll be like, who's this shit coiner? <laughs> oh God. Damn. Yeah, it's okay. brutal out there. But okay. we wanted you here for yeah. a specific. Well, I do believe reason. crypto. I do believe Bitcoin's world changing. Yeah. I do. No, no, you, you don't have to defend um, yourself. You yeah. know. We, we we can all get we can get as many people on as we want talking about Bitcoin all the time, but at the same time there are other people who've got different skills or experiences. Firstly, obviously you want to know about the kidnappers, but as somebody who's come from that traditional background, your observations of our markets and how we operate are super interesting. Yeah. I will say this: if it's a, so, NYMEX um, commodities markets are dominated by two contracts: natural gas and crude oil, gold. For, uh, the energy commodities, natural gas and crude oil; physical commodities, precious metals, uh, gold, silver. Um, platinum. Um, it helps, uh, but if that's all energy commodities was, just crude oil and natural gas, that's it, it'd be decidedly less influential in the world. So with, at the risk of pissing everybody off even more, um, for any asset class, it helps to have permutations and derivatives because um, what you get is you get trading activity between, you get these ARBs, you get these relationships that build. And all of that trading activity create, um, and, and you, some people might say, well, it's all financial, it's all BS. I actually think it's the lifeblood of an economy, right? You, you need to waste, some of it's wasteful, a lot of it's bullshit, a lot of it's bullshit. Um, you need bullshit. I, I'd argue, we, we wouldn't have Google without pets.com. Um, we, we, it would be wonderful if we could sit down as, as a species and invent a really cool technology like the internet or blockchain or other, and say, okay, all right, guys, let, let's avoid the bullshit. Here's what we need. We need a search engine, we need a payments mechanism. Blah, blah. Um, we don't, we're, we're a really ineffective we're ineffective investors as a species. So, so you gotta throw money at things. Bubbles, in my view, are actually good because they pop and you have, but I did a research study a long time ago, shared it with my buddy Nuriel Rubini, who is my friend. Uh, maybe get, really? Yeah, he's my friend, yeah. I think, I think we don't agree, but he's my friend. I've known him, I've known him pre-Bitcoin. I've known okay. him for 20 years. And, uh, and, and I may disagree with everything he says, but I think if you don't listen to a smart, I think he's a smart guy, and if you don't listen, um, uh, you're, you're, it's, your, it's your loss. How do I yeah. get him on this show? Oof. That I'm not so sure about. Um, I'm not that close with him there. <laughs> yeah, but we're, we're friends and I respect him. And I think um, uh, you have to listen to smart people, uh, even if they, if you don't agree with what they say. Um, but I did a study, I did say a long time ago, uh, that Nuriel liked actually. And it showed that during bubbly periods in asset classes, patent filings go up by about four to five times. So for obvious reasons, right? There's more yeah. money, there's more money sloshing through and the money flows to universities. And so if you believe like I do that we're not necessarily that much smarter as a species than we were 50 years ago, um, having more patents has just a higher statistical probability of that eureka moment. So I, I like bubbles. I don't like what they do to average people. I'm a believer in suitability. I don't know that we should be pushing some of the stuff, anything volatile onto someone with like $100 of income. But, um, but that being said, bubbles do produce innovation. And so yeah, a lot of it's crap. A lot of it's gonna go away. But in that going away is going to be the, the infrastructure that moves us to using blockchain uh, for the future. So, um, so yeah, um, I like bubbles. <laughs> That's a great place to end, John. Yeah. Appreciate you, man. Thank you for coming Cheers. on. Thank you for coming to Bedford. I appreciate that as well. we'll Thank have you, you for doing that. Season. Thank you for doing that. Ah. The families I saw there, uh, you're, you're building a community and um, I wish more folks who've made money in Bitcoin or crypto uh, did what you did. Do what you do. Well, they can just give me their money and I'll put it into my team. Or, or St. Jude, I'm a big fan of St. Jude Children's Research. I'll be a plug for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, who's doing a lot of cool stuff with NFTs, by the way. Yeah. Thank you, John. Cheers.